after the lone wanderer completes the quest, The Waters of Life, from the primary story, the Enclave moves into the capital wasteland in force. Even after the Brotherhood of Steel take back the water purifier and Raven Rock is destroyed, these Enclave outposts remain garrisoned with dangerous, highly armed, and hostile Enclave, as Scribe Rothschild tells us when we begin the Broken Steel DLC. Other Enclave locations throughout the wasteland were found. Cut off from their leadership, it was expected that their forces would be in complete disarray. This has not been the case. Even without direct communication to their leaders, these Enclave forces remain hostile towards everyone, posing a serious threat towards Wastelanders and Caravanners in the Capital Wastes. Even if the Brotherhood of Steel destroys the mobile base crawler at the Adams Air Force Base, little changes. A few of these outposts become disorganized, for example, there's an Enclave outpost near the Springvale School, where the Enclave officer in charge executes her soldiers, presumably because they were trying to flee. There's another Enclave outpost near the Nuka-Cola plant, where the reverse happens, and the Enclave soldiers kill their officer, and then attempt to join the Brotherhood of Steel. But the rest of the Enclave outposts in the Capital Wasteland remain unchanged, and most of them are identical like this one, near the Nuka-Cola factory, or the one on the outskirts of Old Olney, where the Enclave has set up modular barricades, satellite dishes, and a small garrison. Sometimes we find captive deathclaws that have been mind-controlled by the Enclave. Sometimes we'll find the Enclave exterminating wastelanders. But the story is always the same. These soldiers, even without their leaders, are hostile to the world, attacking everyone on sight, forcing us to kill them. According to the strategy guide, there are over a dozen of these scattered across the wasteland. But a few of them have data. Data that can help explain exactly what the Enclave was trying to achieve here. Was there a point to all of these outposts aside from just murder? Our first bit of data comes when we discover the Enclave Hilltop Outpost. We find this outpost on a rocky hilltop northwest of the Temple of the Union, northeast of the Minefield, and due east of the Roach King. As we crest the hill, we see the blue glow emanating from their signature Enclave satellite dishes. And this outpost is guarded by a sentry bot. At the top of the hill, behind the barricade, we find an Enclave crate to the left with energy cells inside. Then to the right, we find two more Enclave crates with ammunition and explosives inside. And next to these, two ammo canisters with more ammunition inside. On the southern end of this hill, we find another Enclave crate. And next to a table behind a barricade, we find another ammo box. On the table, we find the Enclave Field Research Terminal. Notice here that we just see three entries. We don't see an American flag. Field entry, Dog, Feral, Kingdom, Animalia, Phylum, Chordata, Class, Mammalia, Order, Carnivora, Family, Canidae, Genus, Canis. Despite extensive testing, I cannot further identify the origins of this mammal. It is clearly Canis familiaris, but generations of mutation have caused it to become its own new breed. An educated guess would place it as Canis lupus, or possibly Canis indicia. Even with the order's characteristically thick skull, the subject's brain waves have been mutated, and territorial aggression amplified. While domestication is still possible with some subjects, the creature should generally be considered hostile. This is interesting, so the Enclave thinks that the wild mongrels we encounter in the wasteland have mutated from either Canis lupus, the gray wolf, or Canis indicia, the Indian Plains Wolf. You'd think that the sheer number of domesticated dogs before the apocalypse would have been the origin of these mutated mongrel dogs, but not according to the Enclave. These guys mutated from wolves. In the next one, Field Entry Large Scorpion, Kingdom Animalia Phylum Arthropoda, Class Arachnida, Order Scorpiones, Family Scorpionidae, Genus Pandinus. Based on research, it at first glance appears to be an enlarged Pandanus Imperator, 
but further testing is required to make a more precise identification. The subject's vesticle has mutated to match its enlarged hypodermic cuculeus, and the neurotoxin now acts on the potassium and calcium channels. Captive subject was hostile and should be considered a minor threat, though they could prove a problem in larger numbers. Anecdotal reports of specimens even larger than those we have observed exist, but it is likely that such reports are exaggerations. Well, it looks like this Enclave outpost hasn't been here long. The giant albino scorpion is practically the only creature I stumble upon. So the Enclave here thinks that the scorpions we encounter mutated from the Pandanus Imperator, or the Emperor Scorpion. And in this regard, the Enclave agrees with Herbert Daring Dashwood. Remember in my video on Dashwood, we explored his terminal at Tenpenny Tower, where we learned that he also thought that the scorpions evolved from the Emperor Scorpion. And in the final one, field entry, Mole Rat. Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Chordata, Class Mammalia, Order Rodentia, Family Bathyurgidae. Subject most closely resembles a heterocephalus glaber with enlargement due to heavy radiation. While much larger in size than generational ancestors, the local variety seems to have similarly low brain function, possibly due to an exceptionally tiny brain organ. Subjects incisors show increased enamel and dentine growth, making them razor sharp. Further study reveals extremely low levels of substance P, giving this subject an incredible tolerance to pain. I will take skin samples of my next subject, as I believe the lack of substance P can be spliced and manipulated for beneficial research. But this theory requires testing in a more fitting lab. So the heterocephalus glaber is the naked mole rat, which is native to East Africa. So how do we explain this? How did the naked mole rat get to North America where it could then mutate after the bombs dropped to become the mole rats we find today? Well, it's possible that they got here the same way the sloths got to Appalachia, which then allowed them to mutate into the mega sloths found there. Perhaps these naked mole rats were once pets. After the bombs dropped in 2077, they escaped captivity and over the past 200 years became as ubiquitous as they are today. Interesting that this Enclave researcher noticed the lack of substance P in the mole rat because the real naked mole rat, its ancestor, has no pain sensitivity in its skin. So the Enclave used this outpost to research local fauna. They act as if they're seeing these creatures for the first time which makes you wonder exactly where have they been? Mole rats and scorpions were prolific even on the west coast. Surely the Enclave would have come upon them by now, unless this particular chapter of the Enclave didn't come from the west coast and has no access to the research that the west coast Enclave had before their destruction. How long had the Enclave been inside Raven Rock before they decided to emerge? If hundreds of years, where did they find so many soldiers? There's so much more to the story of how the Enclave existed in the post-apocalypse that I'd love to know more about. Next is the Silo Outpost. We find the Silo Outpost northwest of the Super Duper Mart. From the Super Duper Mart, if we follow the road northwest, we see a grain silo standing on a nearby hillside next to a ruined farmhouse. As we crest the hill and pass a windmill, we find a familiar Enclave outpost. Moving inside, we can loot the bodies of the dead. We see an enclave cage here, but no entrapped death claw in this one, just a table. Near to this, we find another enclave field research terminal. Notice here that we see an American flag at the top of the screen. This one has nine stars arranged in a circle with one star in the middle of the circle. 
Now we know that the Enclave considers themselves to be the remnants of the U.S. government, but the pre-war American flag has 13 stars arrayed in a circle with one in the middle, not the nine we see here. I don't know if this is just the limitations of ASCII art on this terminal, or if this has some sort of significance. Here again we find three entries. In the first, field entry, Bloat Fly, Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Arthropoda, Class Insecta, Order Diptera, Family Tabanidae, Genus Tabanus Linnaeus. Field observation suggests that the bloatfly is a mutation of the Tabanus horsefly with provocative advances. These evolutionary forebears possessed neither the significant body mass nor projectile sting of the bloatfly. Dissection has revealed that the stinger is engorged with living pupa and neurotoxins. These projectiles are capable of incapacitating large prey on which the bloatfly and its gestating young can freely feed. These neurotoxins are only nominally effective on humans, but can cause localized necrosis at the wound site. This observation is contrary to earlier assumptions that the bloatfly was primarily a scavenger. The bloatfly can be dispatched easily with light weapons, but nonetheless present a threat to field operatives, especially when encountered in numbers. They are hostile and can strike before the target is aware of its presence. Well, it makes sense that bloatflies would have evolved from the horsefly. Horseflies are found practically all over the world, but radiation clearly changed the way they work. Horseflies lay eggs on leaves near water. A far cry from these bloatflies using their pupa as projectiles. Ugh. In the next one, field entry Brahmin, Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Cordata, Class Mammalia, Order Artiodactyla, Family Bovidae, Genus Bos. The Brahmin has been encountered both in domesticated and wild varieties. They are hardy animals, and their utility has made them valuable to humans, in turn allowing these animals to reproduce in quantities beyond what they would otherwise be likely to achieve. They are commonly employed as pack animals. In addition to having two heads, dissection has revealed that these creatures have eight stomachs, but otherwise do not differ significantly from their likely ancestors of the Bovidae family. Typically docile in demeanor, these creatures are useful as both beasts of burden and a food source for field operatives. Interesting that this researcher only says that they descended from the Bovidae family. The Bovidae family includes a wide range of cloven-hoofed animals, including goats, rams, buffalo, bison, gazelles, and cows. The Brahmin likely mutated from the subfamily of Bovidae bovinae, which includes cattle. And in the final one, field entry giant ant, kingdom animalia, phylum arthropoda, class insecta, order hymenoptera, family formicidiae, genus Camponotus. I've determined with near certainty that the aboriginal ants are of the genus Camponotus. My best guess would be that a majority of the ants encountered are black carpenter ants, Camponotus pensylvanicus. However, given that this particular genus consists of over a thousand different species, classification has been difficult. Prior generations of the genus were only considered a nominal threat to humans, but their social and fiercely territorial nature, combined with the greatly increased mass of current varieties, has made them extraordinarily dangerous. The antennae of the ant is the primary sense organ, and soldiers report disabling this to be a successful tactic, as it sends the ant into a frenzy whereupon it attacks anything nearby, human or ant. Well, I don't know if that was common knowledge. If so, I'm ashamed to say that I'm learning that for the first time. We'll have to test that out when I do my video on Grey Ditch. Now, the black carpenter ant is a logical choice as they are native to North America. Strangely enough, the ants we find in the Capital Wasteland aren't black, they're red. And since some of them spit fire, you'd think they evolved from the red fire ants, which don't spit fire, but are red and have extremely painful bites, which is why they're called fire ants. Next, we head to the Enclave Outpost on the shore of the Potomac next to the Springvale School. This is the one where the Enclave officer executed her soldiers. And so we went and repaid the favor. After looting the crates here, we can access the Enclave Research Terminal on a table. Here we again find the American flag with nine stars in a circle, and we find two entries. In the first, field entry Meyer Lurk, Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Arthropoda, 
subphylum Crustacea slash Chelicaratia? Question mark. Class Meristomata slash Malacostracia slash I don't know. Order Huh? Family Hua? Genus Hubu? After going to enormous lengths to procure DNA samples of hypothesized forebears, we cannot explain why ancestry evidence is present from two vastly different creatures, the Limulus polyphemus, horseshoe crab, and the Kalanectes sapigius, the blue crab. It's obvious that a mutation occurred giving this creature bipedal movement and massive growth, but I cannot explain the presence of multiple subphylum markers in DNA slash RNA. Given their mystifying origins, I have decided the species deserves its own classification, and have thus dubbed them Skyla serrata horrendus. They can often be found in sewers and caves, and should be considered hostile and very dangerous, as their chitinous shell provides excellent resistance to both firearms and handheld weapons. They are disgusting creatures, and I cannot fathom their popularity as a food source among the citizens of the Wasteland. Well, clearly written by someone who hasn't been in the Wasteland long. Used to a diet of food packets, maybe? But this is really interesting, because it tells us that the Mirelurks in the Capital Wasteland and the Mirelurks in Boston, Appalachia, and elsewhere are different species. This Enclave officer directly mentions the Mirelurks bipedal movement. So these Mirelurks have only two legs, but the Mirelurks in Boston, Appalachia, and elsewhere have retained the multiple legs inherited from their crab forebears. And the next one, field entry, Great American Cockroach, Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Arthropoda, Class Insecta, Order Blatidia, Family Blatidae, Genus Pleropanita. The insect, colloquially known as the Rad Roach, is one of the most ubiquitous Denzians of the modern American landscape. I believe it to be of the species P. Americana, the American Cockroach albeit a genome strain affected by years of exposure to heavy radiation levels. While winged, they are incapable of flight. I theorize that this is due to the evolutionary failure of the wing appendages to grow in strength commensurate to the surge in body mass. Radroach wings still seem to serve some purpose, however, in interspecies communication. Dark, damp, irradiated habitats, such as the metro tunnels, provide an ideal environment for breeding. Caution should be taken while exploring such areas, but the threat to operatives is minimal, even in great numbers. These must be very similar to the ones in the Commonwealth, though the ones in the Commonwealth can use their wings a bit. They can't fly, but they can use their wings for an elevated jump. Interesting that there are regional differences between them all. Our next location is Camp Row. Camp Row is an unmarked location at an intersection south of the Robot Repair Center and northwest of Vault 108. To get there, I first traveled to Canterbury Commons. And on a side note, when I arrived, I found a bunch of peaceful giant soldier ants. Now, in my game, I chose to convince the antagonizer to leave town peacefully. I never read anywhere in the strategy guide that doing so would cause her to send her ants to Canterbury Commons to protect it. But I'm getting the impression that that's what happens here, as these guys are not hostile. Anyway, if we take the road out of Canterbury Commons and follow it south, eventually we see an enclave outpost smack dab in the middle of the road. We killed the enclave that attacked us, and as we get closer, we get attacked by a bunch of laser turrets. Even though I was under fire from the turrets, I decided to run up and loot the bodies first. And on the corpse of the Enclave officer, we find the experimental row ID. After looting it... What? The turrets stop attacking. Uh, wondering if this has anything to do with the experimental row ID. We can place this back on the body. See what happens. Ah! ah! Grabbing it back! Huh. This ID card makes whomever holds it non-hostile to these turrets. Let's see if we can find an explanation for this. There's an enclave chest just outside a barricade that's been erected to form a cage. 
Inside, we find Enclave Field Research Terminal Row Camp locked with an average lock. After hacking it, oh, we find a very different American flag ASCII art. This one has 15 stars, and they're not arrayed in a circle. I, uh, what's going on here? Below, we find three entries in the first Read First. Department of the Army, Research and Development Field Operations Sector 693R. Welcome. One, you have been chosen by our great president to participate in this Camp Row experiment. We have strategically deployed you to test out our newest technology, the R76H30 chip, herein referred to as the Row chip. The Row chip sends out a short-range signal that will allow you to freely wander this and only this camp under the protection of the provided armaments. It is suggested that you do not remove this card for any reason, as the defense systems will only recognize the person in possession of the Row chip. Ah, well that explains why they stopped firing as soon as we looted it. 3. Thank you for your participation. We will be retrieving you in approximately 1 to 9 months. What? Oh, this poor guy! I suddenly feel sorry for this Enclave officer. Take your time, Enclave, no rush. Next, we can request main base connection. Function disabled. Message zero. And the same is true for the power down defensive grid. Now, there's a generator in this little room, and it's connected to all of these turrets. We can try to take it out. But it doesn't appear to do anything. The turrets still chirp at us. If we remove the experimental road chip, they turn hostile again. Well, the last thing we need is the turrets taking out wandering caravans. So I decided to just get rid of them. There we go. Canterbury Commons, trade is once again safe. Our next outpost is nearby, northwest of the row outpost, due west of the robot repair center, and slightly southeast of the regulator headquarters. As we approach, we find a battle already underway. A Deathclaw! We see the place littered with corpses, Enclave officers and Enclave soldiers. Off in the distance, we see the lone surviving Enclave soldier still fighting with a Deathclaw. We can take him out. After looting the corpses, we see a table in the middle of the camp. And on the table, a bunch of gear. Looks like a couple of combat knives, some brass knuckles, a revolver, a 10 millimeter pistol, and a nail board. This isn't high tech gear. What's the Enclave doing with this? Well, to find out, we can hack into this Enclave field research terminal. And this one doesn't have an American flag. All right, the inconsistency is killing me, guys. Department of the Army, Peacekeeping and Recovery Field Operations, Sector 27P. We have two options. In the first, inventory weapons, Weapon, type, serial. Combat knife, SSGSSO1. All right, looks like they assigned a serial number to each item here. N99 pistol, brass knuckles, two brass knuckles, okay. Combat knife, 32 caliber pistol, kitchen knife, board with nail. Oh, it's an inventory of everything we found on the table. Where did this come from? We find out in the next one, transient census. Name, Zundel C, sex, male, Serial number. It's a list of all of the wastelanders this outpost has apprehended and disposed of. H. Hastings and K. Hastings, a family. J. Bonner, B. Schrader, Junk Flinger, and Spookia. Okay, so we have two superheroes on the list here. I would have loved to have met Junk Flinger. Then, looting the Enclave crates nearby, we find more gear that's unusual for an Enclave chest including metal armor and pre-war clothing. More of the personal possessions they must have looted from the Wastelanders who happened to walk through here. Can't say I'm sad that a Deathclaw ruined their day. We find the next one near to the Fort Bannister Crater. This crater is right next to Fort Bannister, which we explored in my video on the Talon Company. It overlooks the crater and has a number of chests nearby. 
and on a nearby table we find the Enclave Field Research Terminal Crater Camp, locked with an average lock after hacking it. Oh, the American flag is back, but it's a 15-star version. Come on, guys, get your act together. We find three entries in the first read first. Welcome. One, you have been chosen by our great president to explore and collect samples at the crater located in Sector 762. Two, the provided armaments stationed with you have proven reliable during early testing. However, should any problems arise, you are recommended to power down the defense grid using this terminal. Three, thank you for your participation. Well, from here, we can again try to request main base connection and power down the defense grid, but both are non-functional. I'm not sure what powering down the grid would have even done, as we didn't even find a grid when we arrived. We find the last one on the road just southwest of Vault 92. Taking the road south from Vault 92, we can pass an outcast patrol. Kasdan said you're clear. And we hear sounds of battle coming from the Enclave outpost nearby. But when we peer that way, oh, well, it looks rather empty. Oh! What are they doing over there? What are the outcasts shooting at? Oh, it's a raider camp to the north. So the Enclave was fighting these raiders. That's why they had been lured so far from camp. Did you see that shit? Jumpy, I guess. All right, you guys go ahead and walk off. I thought I saw another tick on my pit boy here. Oh! Oh, wait a minute, there's one more. The wonders of Robco technology is telling me there's another one right over here. Let's check in this overturned silo. Oh! <laughs> yeah, I've been collecting mini nukes for the entire game, and doggone it, I'm gonna use them. Well, this raider camp is unrelated to the Enclave Outpost, but we can explore it since we're here. We find a mutilated corpse and a bunch of junk inside the base of this overturned silo. Moving into the silo, we see some raider beds and a bunch of stuff that the explosion scattered all over the ground, including some sugar bombs, medics, buff out, a stim pack, and some mentats. Inside the barn, we find a copy of Dean's Electronics on a metal shelf, Mentats on top of a locker, and buff out inside it with jet on the ground below. And there's nothing up the staircase to the loft. Okay, turning around and going south, we can head back towards the Enclave camp. We got that one. Creeping closer, we can see if we got them all. Oh, oh, it's a scorpion. Scorpion no more. Leaping down, we see the corpses of the Enclave. I didn't kill these guys. This Enclave outpost must have been attacked by raiders. Raiders which lured the only survivor back towards the raider camp. Either that or the scorpion did this. Those albino red scorpions are pretty tough. Turning left, we can leap into the back of this truck here. After looting some Enclave officer bits, we find a bunch of purified water. There's blood spatter on the wall and the floor, but not much else. After looting some Enclave crates on the side of the truck, one beneath the satellite dish and one beneath a desk, we can read the terminal on the desk. Oh, and the circle flag is back. Two entries in the first field report PFC, Private First Class M. Scott. Field report prepared by NCO J. Tuckman by audio dictation on behalf of PFC Matthew Scott. PFC Scott's voice is the only source recorded in the following text. Begin file. Sir, I encountered three ferals on my patrol. This was somewhere around 0300 hours, I think, and it was dark, so they saw me first. I discharged my firearm four times, fatally striking two of the three. My weapon jammed just before I could fire on the third target. And just then, I realized it wasn't engaging. I knew our orders were to report on anything unusual, and, well, I thought that was pretty strange. He actually followed me back here on his own. We put him in the trailer with the other, and he's been quiet as you like. Strangest thing I've ever seen. End file. In the next one, orders commanding officers' eyes only. 
Mission Directive. Establish and enforce Enclave presence among general populace. Disposal of genetic non-compliance offenders. Wow, so if you're mutated in the Capital Wasteland, you're guilty of genetic non-compliance. Wish I had found this before I did my Why the Enclave is Wrong video. 1. Establish constituency enforcement point at coordinates 39.138 by negative 77.070. Monitor civilian movement in area and debrief superior regarding any events of notable significance or regularity. 2. Distribute purified water rations to civilians willing to submit to genetic compliance screening. Participation in screening is compulsory for all civilians. And use of force is authorized in enforcement. 3. Genetic non-compliance offenders should be detained at checkpoint. 4. To conserve consumption of Enclave resources, detainees should be disposed of by flame only when withholding facility becomes overcrowded or detainees become unmanageable, whichever comes first. Holy cow, that explains the purified water and why we find it in the back of this truck covered in blood spatter. They were luring wastelanders here with purified water only so they could genetically test them to determine whether or not they had been mutated, and if they had, they would have been incinerated to death back here. This gives us the clearest evidence of exactly what the Enclave would have done had they kept Project Purity. And that's the final bit of data we get from these Enclave outposts. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that the Enclave seemed to be ignorant of common wasteland critters. They were doing research on them to see which of them could potentially benefit the Enclave. They settled upon the Deathclaw, as we learned in my Broken Steel video about Old Olney, which makes them hypocrites for trying to purify the wasteland of mutations, and then they go ahead and use mutated Deathclaws in battle, but that's a topic for another video. We learned that they were actively developing new technology and were even using their own soldiers to experiment with this technology. The RHO chip is an example. And they saw it as their sovereign mission to rid America of any and all genetic impurities. Not just super mutants, not just ghouls, but everyone, wastelanders included. Which is why they lured wastelanders with purified water only to incinerate them, and why we found evidence of them having apprehended wastelanders at the crossroads south of Canterbury Commons. There are over a dozen more of these outposts in many key locations across the wasteland. Now that we know more about their motives, I, for one, won't even hesitate to destroy them. But what are your thoughts? Do you think the Enclave had a point? Do you think they really were making the Wasteland a better place in their own way? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a brand new shirt in the shop. Lion's Pride. The Brotherhood does its best, but sometimes they need a little something special. That's where Lion's Pride comes in. This design comes on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find it on other products as well, like smartphone cases, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.